as coercive control now becomes the family court weapon of choice to wield hate, acrimony and family destruction with spurious allegations encouraged by all too often sick family lawyers who have no duty of care to any children who jump at the opportunity of pitting parents against each other in new, long drawn out wars for financial gain and with common sense now exiting every family court building with pretty much any unfortunate marital or relationship incident being labelled as abuse, the result is days and days of fact-finding hearings often based on total nonsense whilst the non-resident parent is being refused contact with their children for months on end and the children becoming significantly harmed by spiteful vengeful parents alongside the madness of the family court system itself which is failing to get a grip on spurious coercive control allegations. You can't write the script. Since coercive control has now been directed by the Court of Appeal in the case of H, N and others to be the priority consideration when it comes to abuse, the family court has overnight gone through a seismic change. The broken, inept, incompetent, irrational and incomprehensible family court appears to have lost all control with what I am seeing as volumes of spurious coercive control allegations now flooding into the system. Today I am going to give 10 examples of what I am repeatedly seeing as the type of allegations that are being dropped as part of the coercive control bomb. These examples come from a wide range of sources and have been adapted and generalized. But before I go nuclear in this explosive blog, let me run my excellent introduction. I am Philip Kedge, a retired police chief inspector and the director of the Mackenzie Friend UK Network, supporting people through family court. In all my blogs, my views and opinions are entirely my own. And please help me by subscribing, liking and hitting that notification bell. If you need to find help with any aspect of your family court case, please contact me at www.contactphil.co.uk. As you will expect from me by now, I have done my research. I have consulted the Urban Dictionary in relation to when people spout nonsense and rubbish. It defines such assertions as being a load of bollocks. So, I am going to let you decide for yourselves whether the following examples are evidence of serious coercive control, that justifies a parent being denied contact with their children for months and months on end, or nothing more than a load of bollocks. I will be applying the examples to my fictional training characters, Mr. and Mrs. Groves, who have two children, Sandy, age four, and Daniel, age 12. Abigail Groves is the resident parent and alleging coercive control against Mr. Matthew Groves, who has not seen his children for four months since separation. He applied for a child arrangements order and Abigail has submitted a statement alleging coercive control and the courts have ordered a fact-finding hearing. Let's take a look at the first allegation. In 2006, Mr. Groves shouted at me. I can't remember exactly what he shouted, but it left me feeling extreme fear and anxiety. From that moment on, I had to tread on eggshells. 
Mr. Grove says in response that he can't remember that event, but points out that they then got engaged, got married, had two children, until they separated 14 years later. Now, what is the difference between fear and extreme fear? You will notice in statements that in potentially spurious allegations, the parent will use the words like extreme to inflate, exaggerate and maximise their allegations. This will usually present a reaction that is totally disproportionate to the allegation. How does the raising of a voice cause extreme fear? Extreme fear of what exactly? This is often done repeatedly throughout a statement. Also note that in this case, the allegation of being shouted at goes back to 2006. Really? Let's look at allegation number two. When we got married in 2007, we moved into a house 100 miles away from my parents, friends and relatives. I felt isolated and alone. He told me to find new friends and was totally unsupportive. I felt devalued and trapped. Mr. Groves explains that they got married and to be able to afford to buy their first family home, they had to move away. They were both on the mortgage and deeds. They were both excited about being able to purchase their first property. It is fascinating, isn't it? Loads of words infer inferring isolation and being lonely. Buzzwords for coercive control allegations. But is this not simply describing what millions of people do when they get married or enter into a civil partnership? It's my understanding that you commit to each other, not to your mum and dad or best mates. But of course, I might be completely wrong. You decide. Also note that the family home is referred by Abigail in cold clinical terms as a house. Again, a trick to give the impression of detachment and a lack of warmth. When Mr. Groves suggested finding new friends, was that not common sense advice, which is now being twisted into a lack of sensitivity? What do you think? is a pattern of coercive control starting to emerge. Moving on to allegation three. In 2009, when I fell pregnant with Daniel, I continued to feel unsupported and isolated. I gave up work to look after my child. I was not appreciated and felt undervalued. He took absolutely no interest in Daniel or me. Mr. Groves responds by saying that it was agreed that Abigail would give up her job whilst he maintained his higher income employment. Indeed, during the pregnancy and after the birth, he says that it was him who felt pushed aside and ignored. Abigail wanted to be the one who fed and changed the baby. If he tried, she would shout at him for interfering. So he did let her do most of the baby care. Welcome to the world of having your first child. There is no dress rehearsal. You don't know how life is going to change until it happens. Intimacy may change. The family dynamics will change. There could be tensions, but is it coercive control? You put the pieces together. Also, note that Abigail referred to Daniel as being my child, clearly demonstrating that she sees the children as her sole possession. Also notice how she dehumanizes the pregnancy. She refers to how she fell pregnant 
as if it was something that was done to her. This is again the subtle language that lawyers may often use to harden the text and invoke a feeling of a cold and unemotional relationship. And of course, in spurious allegations, the parent will often and continu continually refer to feelings. Why do they do that? Well, because you can't prove or disprove feelings. And feelings are subjective. So it becomes a useful tool or indeed weapon to keep attacking the other parent with. Let's move on to the next allegation. In 2011, when Daniel was two years of age, I was invited to go away to Ibiza for a, a week with girlfriends. Matthew would not let me. I felt controlled and dominated. There was an atmosphere in the house which was detrimental and harmful to the welfare of the child. First of all, notice how this suddenly jumps from 2009 to 2011. What? Nothing else happened during that time? And I didn't think Abigail had any friends anyway because she was lonely and isolated. Matthew states that he does recall this matter. He says that money was tight and that they should instead have a family holiday together. He said that there was indeed an atmosphere in the home because Abigail spent the next three months trying to bully him into saying yes, sometimes shouting at him and once slamming a door in his face whilst calling him the C word. He recalls that the previous year he was invited to a stag do but Abigail refused to let him stay overnight at the hotel and he had to get a taxi home. Is this a marital issue or is it coercive control? Who is being coercively controlling? Why on planet earth is this even a matter for the family court 10 years later? Your thoughts please. After the birth of Sandy in 2016, Abigail explains that she suffered from postnatal depression. She states, I felt unsupported, anxious and imprisoned within the house. I had not worked for years and, and was made to feel inferior as I was not generating any income. I was fearful that he was instilling in Daniel a set of values which involves treating women as being inferior to men. I was being financially abused by not being allowed to work. Mr Grove states that there were difficult days. Abigail did suffer from postnatal depression and was on medication for several months after which the GP suggested that Abigail should seek private counselling and support for anxiety. But Abigail declined this. Matthew explains that during her illness, he had to take on the majority care of the children. He states that he was fully supportive, but all intimacy between them had stopped. Is this domestic abuse? Is this coercive control? Or is this a marriage that is simply starting to head in the wrong direction? Who is responsible? Does it matter? If you start stringing all the previous allegations together, does this now become coercive control that should deny Mr. Gross contact with their children for months on end? Or, is it just a load of bollocks that the family courts are failing to get a grip on, which is resulting in relationships being destroyed? Allegation number six. Abigail states as follows. From 2016 to 2019, 
Matthew pressurised me into having sex that I found degrading. This placed me at extreme physical and mental risk. I was in fear of saying no. If I said no, then I would be scared that it would provoke an outburst or reaction. I lived treading on eggshells. He once pushed a chair over in anger in the bedroom. Mr. Groves explains that for 18 months after the birth of Sandy, there was little sexual intimacy. He used to suggest trying things in an attempt to jumpstart sex again. They both tried and experimented, but it was difficult for both of them. He says that they were struggling to reconnect and Abigail was always very anxious. Both felt a certain amount of pressure. But to now turn that years later into potential assertions of sexual abuse and control is outrageous. He can't believe that she would stoop that low. He says that he did once, many years ago, push a chair over in the bedroom. But that was during another argument. But what about the time that she threw a hairbrush at him? You decide, where are we now on the coercive control scale that the court is requiring a fact-finding for? Does it justify the continuation of Mr. Groves having no contact, perhaps for m many months more? Are you starting to feel sorry for Mr. Groves, or would you like him to attend a domestic violence perpetrators programme? Let's move on. Mr. Groves repeatedly called me fat and lazy. This was in the presence of the children. Mr. Groves admits that he did call her fat and lazy on about three occasions and accepts that was wrong and abusive, but asks what about the many times she called him that C word, dickhead, twat and an effing bastard, which was once also in the presence of the children. What do you do with that one, folks? Let's have a look at number eight. I was financially controlled. I wanted to return to work, but after being out of work so long, was feeling extreme anxiety and was totally unsupported. Matthew belittled and mocked me by telling me to go and work in a charity shop. I had to constantly rely on his money to support myself and the family home. Matthew says, well, I did suggest that she could work in a charity shop. I was trying to help her gain confidence in trying to get back into employment. I suggested that Abigail should try and work for a couple of hours on a Saturday. Abigail was never denied money. We had a joint bank account. She had her own bank cards. This is a total fabrication and twisting of the truth. Please also notice something here. Abigail now uses the words family home rather than house. This is because she is talking about her contribution to it and wants it to seem warmer. The change of wording is interesting, isn't it? Is this sounding like financial abuse to you? You decide. Now on to number nine and one of my favourites. He would regularly watch extreme porn. As a woman, I found this degrading and humiliating and made me feel inadequate, inferior and that it objectified women. I believe that he will pass on and instill these negative values onto Daniel. I don't want Daniel to grow up objectifying women. He would also watch porn when the children were in the house. I would be worried 
if the children were left alone with him. Matthew responds by saying, well, that clearly wipes out 90% of men from ever being able to see their children again. He states that he did regularly watch porn privately, obviously not in the presence and hearing of the children, as most of the population has sex whilst children are in the house. How is this child abuse? Also think about this, Abigail once again throws in the word extreme in relation to pornography. Really? What? The family court is really expected to have a hearing on what types of pornography is extreme or not? Also, why is it that when men watch pornography it's extreme porn, but when women watch it it's called erotica? I'm not kidding. These types of allegations are being made in the family court. What is going on? And of course, the icing on the cake, that little smear, that little assertion, that sprinkle of allegation in relation to child abuse, when Abigail stated that she would be worried if the children were to be alone with him. How spiteful is that? From 2019 to separation, I was constantly living in extreme fear and extreme anxiety. The atmosphere in the house was detrimental to the welfare of the children. I was physically intimidated by him. He is much larger than me and his physical presence scared me. He would often look at me with menacing eyes. Every day I, I was treading on eggshells and could not give priority to the needs of the children. I was scared that I would provoke a reaction. Mr Groves says the following, that he felt exactly the same. The atmosphere was toxic, the marriage was falling apart. On many occasions he suggested therapy and marriage counselling. But Abigail refused. He said that Abigail would look at him in total hate. The next door's cat got more attention than he did. It was as if Abigail wanted the mar marriage to end but was constantly pushing him into the corner to be the one to end it so that she did not feel as if she had failed. The children were indeed caught in the middle. In the end, he says he did the right thing and left. However, Abigail has not let him see the children since. So let's draw this to a conclusion. I invited you from the start to make your own minds up. Do these allegations or other similar allegations you may be facing constitute serious coercive control that may, with justification, Send a parent on a domestic abuse perpetrator's course. Have them denied contact for months on end with their children. Or confine them to the indignation of contact centres or supervised contact. Alternatively, are these nothing more than spurious allegations fueled by spiteful hate and a load of bollocks? Not my words, remember, as defined by the Urban Dictionary. Are the parents making these allegations themselves, the actual child abusers, through causing conflict and denying contact? If so, why is the family court not only refusing to recognise this abuse, but is, but is instead helping them throw the other parent under the family court bus. Why is this so serious? Well, because such allegations are now flooding into the family courts under the new gifted and ultimate weapon of choice called coercive control. The family court has itself created a nightmare scenario where it is no longer 
just a boxing ring for parents to throw punches and slug it out. It has turned the family court into a gladiatorial arena where the resident parent is literally wanting to put the other parent to the sword with as much blood on the sand as possible. As I speak, lives and children's relationships with the non-resident parents are being destroyed. In my opinion, the family court is not only allowing this to happen, but are complicit in it. When you have high level family court judges who are quite frankly giving an impression of looking like this, who state that when a teenage son farts on his father and the father responds with expletives, that it is entirely wrong to excuse it as understandable, albeit inappropriate parenting, but instead goes down the route of applying the Domestic, Domestic Abuse Act of 2021, stating that it is worthy of a fact-finding hearing, with the outcome likely to have relevance to child contact. Then believe me, there is no bottom to the pit of family court madness. When the resident parent, fueled by hate and their disgraceful family lawyers, then seek to combine such incidents throughout a marriage or relationship to build and then drop the coercive control bomb, what chance does the non-resident parent have? So let me finish with the following thought. Is it time to start fighting back against spurious coercive control allegations? I will be exploring that question very soon. Thanks for listening.